I see a lot of people are still shuffling in. Uh, so, Okay. Okay, everyone. Uh, let's get seated. We're starting our next panel. This one is called The Inspiring Stories of Change. And we have four speakers, and I will be your moderator. Uh, among them are Dr. Lawrence Delina. He's an assistant professor at Hong Kong University. We also have Ms. Sarini Achavan Nun Takul. Uh, she is from Fair Finance Thailand. We have Professor Narumon Arunotai. Uh, she is a board member with Asian Indigenous Peoples Pact. And also Mr. Hans Gutman. Executive Director at the Asian Disaster Preparedness Center. So can my speakers please come up on the stage and let's all get seated. Hi everyone, uh, I hope the coffee break was energizing and you guys got to uh, have a few nibbles. Um, so yeah, I'm really excited for this panel. I just also wanted to introduce myself. Uh, I have a confession, uh, my name is Hui John, I'm a journalist, um, and actually I'm not a climate journalist. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yet, yet. well, so I mean, I think you know this was highlighted in our keynote uh, speech this morning, right, where uh, he really said, like, you know, there's more and more people coming into this issue, and it's a necessity, right? Um, I cover China, but I just think, like, climate is something that each reporter is going to end up covering because it's going to touch on everything uh, from the economy to vulnerable communities to, like, literally natural disasters that are happening basically every month. So much flooding in southern China this past season. Um, and so with that said, uh, the other idea that I wanted to just note is that I think as someone who is an outsider to climate, um, I sometimes find that stories or just the issue can be quite abstract. It's very focused on numbers or it's very technical. Um, and it's hard to understand, I think, unless you already have some background knowledge in it. But I think with this panel, we're gonna try and address that. We're bringing together a really diverse set of voices uh, from all sorts of different fields. And uh, they're gonna be telling us some of their success stories. And I think really enliven um, this issue for you uh, through some very concrete examples. And yeah, uh, so we're going to start off uh, with our first speaker is Professor Naruman Arunotai. Um, she is going to talk to us about her work with indigenous peoples. And so Professor Arunotai, 
Can you tell us a bit about the indigenous community that you work with here in Thailand? What you've learned from them? And I guess some of the successes from th those lessons? And I understand that they actually had a really big role to play in saving lives with the Indian Ocean tsunami more than 20 years ago. So if you could tell us about that. Thank you and uh, good morning everyone. Uh, actually, I also uh, belong to Chulalongkorn University, but I'm here on behalf of Asia Indigenous Peoples Pact, uh, which is regional organization working on indigenous people, especially uh, indigenous rights and values. Um, I myself work among indigenous people, especially in southern Thailand, uh, known as sea nomads. Um, we had sea nomads actually in Myanmar, in Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, and the Philippines. And uh, I think they have um, uh, inspiring values and some of the actions that we can learn from them. Actually, when I was in the field as anthropologist uh, doing the research on them, many people around there thought that I was a teacher going to teach them something. But actually, I was there to learn. And then when being with them, researching on them, I became more and more inspired. So maybe if I can tell you uh, a few more things, um, especially uh, when uh, Wu asked us about the Indian Ocean tsunami, the people that I work with, they survived. The whole village uh, survived because they ran to a higher ground. Although they don't have any written language, any written material on the tsunami, they have their own word for tsunami. And the story is told that they had to run to a higher ground when water receded. So something like this, it's, it's passed on. It's like a warning sign. It's like a sociocultural memory that they had a long time ago. But then we're going to talk about challenge in the second part, right? So I'll, I'll, I'll uh, say something about inspiring first. Um, the children of indigenous people, they, they don't like to go to school, not because they're not doing well. They're doing too well, especially outside the classroom. So what's inspiring is that we had this thing called field school where we uh, work with them, uh, taking the children, and actually the children take us out of the classroom. And then they show us something about like leaves, plants, animals, and then they also do the uh, mapping the, the hand-drawn map. And then we transfer this along with the adults so that we have GIS mapping that we can you know, compare with the, the government version and then the academic version. So that's really inspiring of them to, to teach us, to take us out of the classroom and then take us the, the, their perspectives and their worldviews and social values on that the environment that they live so close to including, you know, disaster, including the, the dangerous aspects of the sea and of, of the nature that's surrounding them. I think another uh, inspiring uh, moment is uh, when, when we, can, we can really feel uh, the values, uh, relational values of them and nature. So actually, there's not human and nature. Everything is whole. So really holistic uh, perspective of seeing integrity of, of the world. So I think this is really inspiring of relational value. Whereas maybe most of us, when we look at nature, it's mostly instrumental value, the, the value of nature that will benefit to human being. Uh, also, when we talk about uh, ecological services, I, I think maybe the indigenous people wouldn't be so comfortable with the word services. It means that, you know, services, uh, but not, you know, the, uh, the gratitude that you have for nature. And the, the last thing that is uh, quite inspiring is adapt adaptability. You know, although the village is gone, although there's fire in the village and everything's gone, they are, uh, they are able to bounce back and then uh, built the village uh, within like seven days because they, they are non-accumulative. Uh, unlike us, I think if we look in the, the our cupboard and then wardrobe, there are a lot of things. So we, in order to rebuild, I think we, we need a lot of reserve in order to do that. Whereas indigenous people, they see this as you know being part of nature, disaster being part of nature. Tsunami came because human uh, did a lot of uh, dirty and uh, bad things for the earth, and then the earth cleansed itself. 
So I think that's um, some of the uh, values, some of the inspiring stories that we learn from indigenous people. Thank you. Thank you. Um, actually, we do have time for one follow-up question, so keep the mic. Um, can you just tell us a bit more about this myth um, that allowed them to move to higher ground and like save lives in this disaster? Yes, and I forgot to introduce the, the indigenous people. Yeah, that yeah. I with. Sorry. Tell us who they are. What are they called? And uh -huh, right. It's okay. As I mentioned, we have five groups in five countries, and even in Thailand, we have subgroups called the Mokan, the Moklan, and Uraklawe. So three subgroups, and the group that that had this uh, legend really in their memory is the Mokan. But the other two groups, it's because they have been in centralized education, you know, centralized education system. They have less and less time and opportunity to learn about their cultural heritage. They learn a lot about Thai history. They learn a lot about science, something like this. So I think uh, if we would like to provide that opportunity for them uh, to, to keep on their uh, oral tradition, to keep on their kind of education, it would be good. So uh, all the three groups have the legend about seven waves. And we knew that usually tsunami didn't come as big giant wave, right? But rollers or uh, several waves uh, coming one after another. So they said that uh, once in every one or two generations, this wave would come and then the, uh, the granddaughter, grandson, please beware of this and other disasters because they are really observant and they are really the, the instinct you know, of, of knowing and uh, being uh, having a life by the sea for a long time. They can uh, notice uh, the difference, uh, whatever happening around the, uh, the area. Wow, okay. And they were able to do that before, I suppose, the formal scientific warnings came? Uh, yeah, yes, actually the island was really far from shore and the island also have some tourists and instead of taking the tourists back to shore, uh, they instinctively, although they haven't experienced tsunami, they took the boat out to sea, you know, to avoid that uh, impact. So I think just, uh, just some, uh, some word that we use, I think in several of your languages, some of uh, your language adopt the term tsunami a Japanese term into your language. But then also in Thai language, we officially used tsunami as you know this uh, big wave. But then these people, the three groups, have their own term uh, for these big waves. So it's interesting. Okay. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Naraman. Uh, so next, we are going to move to Kun Sarni. Um, she works directly with banks on hydropower financing, and her work is focused on advocating for better sustainable finance and better sustainable f banking principles. Um, so yeah, if you can tell us a bit more about green finance uh, and some of the successes that your team has had, uh, as I understand, there's no common language, unfortunately, <laughs> involved in green finance from country to country and region to region. Um, so yeah, tell us about your experience here. Ah, thank you. Um, so let me first introduce our network a little bit. Uh, so I represent both South Forest uh, and, and Fair Finance Thailand Coalition. Uh, Fair Finance uh, is a coalition of uh, one research company, which is uh, South Forest, and four CSOs uh, that share a common interest in pushing for uh, better sustainable banking practices in Thailand. So we basically engage with the regulator, mainly the Bank of Thailand and the SEC, and also we assess the ESG policies of 11 largest Thai banks. So we've been doing this for the past seven years. Uh, and also since International Rivers is one of our coalition members, uh, we have also been engaging the banks directly on um, trying to make them see the material ESG risk of large hydropower projects in the Mekong uh, for the past six years. So if, if you're interested in any of what I'm talking about, you can uh, please welcome to go to our website at Fair Finance Thailand and uh, quite a few of our case studies about the Mekong hydropower are in English. Uh, that's kind of my way of, uh, I guess, my excuse for not, uh, I'm sorry for making it uh, brief <laughs> because the challenges are quite complex. I wouldn't say that we have had successes. I would say we have right now progress and momentum in the space. Uh, the success would definitely be uh, the bank's clear role in, uh, in aiding the social transformation that needs to take place. 
a clear role in so what we would call now transition finance, which is actually much more important, I think, than green finance, because green finance is basically you just finance some green projects off the ground, right? Green fuel projects like renewable. And if those, as those become more and more uh, e economically competitive, banks, uh, it will be very easy for banks to decide to finance um, their clients. But what's much more challenging is the transition finance, is how to get them to move the funding away from the brown projects to the green projects. Um, so at, um, in Thailand right now, from the perspective of Fair Finance Thailand, we observe, I would say, three interesting progress uh, taking place. So one, I would say, is the launch of Thailand Taxonomy uh, in June last year. So um, just a brief, uh, I guess for those of you who may be unfamiliar, taxonomy in this uh, context is just basically a classification of activities that you would classify as green. Uh, so Thailand uh, follows more or less the EU taxonomy, uh, which classifies uh, activities as green or amber or red, essentially. Uh, and we um, try to, well, there's actually now, right now, development of phase two taxonomy. But what was passed last year was phase one, which covers only two sectors, energy and transport. Uh, but that's also significant because they account for the majority of uh, greenhouse gases. Um, so what Fair Finance Thailand did was we engaged with the um, taxonomy uh, board, uh, so mainly the Bank of Thailand, and we sent in comments and suggestions, criticisms of the draft taxonomy, and so we were able to, uh, we, from our standpoint, strengthen the uh, content of the taxonomy. Uh, for example, um, we were able to uh, insert very clearly in the taxonomy that a coal-fired uh, power plant is, is out, so it's not green. Uh, we strengthen the uh, do no significant harm criteria for the hydropower uh, projects. So, so uh, Thailand taxonomy is not, although I would say we model after the EU taxonomy, is not the same, right? So first of all, like we only stick to one environmental objective, which is just climate mitigation. And so that's why there needs to be the do no significant harm and the minimum social safe safeguard to make sure that the green projects don't uh, impact the other objectives. Um, so, and for, you can imagine hydropower is very uh, highly sensitive and potentially very high uh, ELG risk. Uh, so we were happy to be able to strengthen those criteria. Uh, so hydropower process could be green, but they would have to follow uh, more do no significant harm criteria. I think that's the first development. Uh, although that remains a voluntary instrument, we are continuing to advocate to integrate the taxonomy into the proper reporting and disclosure regulations uh, for Thai banking industry, similar to what has been done in the EU. Um, the second one I would mention is just in general a plethora, I would say now, of um, various uh, ELT standards, net zero uh, guidelines and plans. As you know, you know banks are, Speaking as someone who worked like nine years at a bank, uh, we, are, we know nothing really except finance, right? <laughs> so we cannot tell if you know, any project is green or not. So we need a lot of standards, a lot of um, clear guidelines to follow. And so in that case, uh, in Thailand now, there's a lot of recognition for that. And for example, the, we have Sam Commercial Bank, one of our largest project finance lenders, um, applying, uh, adopting the equator uh, principles, which is kind of the sort of international standard for project financing. So they became the first equator bank. Actually, some other bank, although they didn't uh, adopt this um, standard, also mentioned in their credit policy that they would now ask their major project finance clients to try to comply with some uh, major uh, equator principle standards. So I think that there's a recognition that banks have to adhere to, to uh, higher standards, international standards. Um, there's also um, a continuing effort, uh, for example, by the UNFFI, who has a net zero banking alliance. Um, and I think they produce quite a few very interesting guidelines on how banks should set the climate goals, uh, how, how to produce transition plan that is in line with um, the ambitions of Paris Agreement, for example. In Southeast Asia now, only Malaysian and Singaporean banks so far have signed on as members of the net zero banking alliance, but I'm sure that uh, Thai banks will follow. Uh, this is my hope anyway, <laughs> because it seems to be the, the Bank of Thailand asks the banks anyway right now more, point, more uh, specific questions about you know, transition plan and what their net zero goals look like. There now exists a kind of a program, for example, at the Bank of Thailand, they talk about uh, financing the transition with some focus on SME. So I think this is the momentum is still there. So it's just a matter of uh, how fast the progress can be made. The last progress I would mention is that all major banks in Thailand now endorse the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. Um, and we actually at Fair Finance Thailand use that as a, as a door opening tool to basically uh, bring the affected communities uh, in Demikong 
region to meet with the banks, the financiers of large hydropower, hydropower projects. We have done that uh, successfully, uh, I think three times so far. And uh, although we were not successful in you know, preventing financing <laughs> necessarily of the dam by Thai banks, at least I think the banks were more mindful of the uh, material ESG risks. And I think that nothing replaces uh, I mean, nothing substitutes um, hearing directly from affected communities. Uh, you know, it's one thing when you read about ESG risk on paper. Uh, it's another to really bring the affected communities to, to basically explain to the banks why they are concerned and what happened was the previous projects, why the, re uh, the relocation was not successful and so on. Yeah, so those I would consider successes in, uh, well, not really successes, but maybe progress in our space. Thank you. Thank you. And I know that you will continue pushing for progress <laughs> with the banks. Uh, okay, and then our next speaker is Professor Lawrence Delina, and he's also going to speak uh, about uh, why well, I think this is a through a theme that's common through all of our speakers so far, which is uh, energy justice. Um, and but he will also talk. He will talk about policy making. And so, Professor, I understand like you've done some work with the community along the Thai Myanmar border. Uh, I think you have some lessons and maybe inspiration and maybe a little bit of success too to share with us about this experience. So tell us about it. Yeah, okay, yeah, very good morning everybody and then thanks so much for, 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 for having me and congratulations again to SEIA for their 20th year in Asia. 20, uh, looking forward for 20 more years. Um, thank you so much for all the good things that you are doing for our region. So um, as we as Wei Xiong has mentioned, I will be talking about energy justice, particularly looking at local community level. But before that, I would like to briefly introduce what my research group is doing at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. So we're basically looking at energy systems as also uh, climate systems, particularly in its relationships and linkages with society. When we talk about society, it's, uh, it, it's really broad, but our, our focus is really on vulnerable populations. So we, all, we, we look at older populations, uh, persons with, 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 with uh, special abilities or disabilities, uh, people uh, living in, in rural areas, so rural farmers, as well as indigenous populations. Uh, but for this particular um, case study that I will be talking about, uh, I can claim that it's also a success, but it's, I, I found it very inspirational. Uh, so I, I, did a, I did a field work when I was still at Boston University doing my postdoc at the Thailand-Myanmar border on this community called the Padeng community, uh, where they demonstrated that local community sustainable energy solutions can actually manifest at the local rural level without much interve intervention from government. So that is uh, the, the key. In, the first key insight is that local people, community-oriented people, village people, even those living in dense forests, can actually also process just energy transitions. So the technologies that they have developed are pretty mundane. So it's it's basically using the feedstock from uh, from their uh, food waste as well as uh, grass cuttings, cow manures, to to produce uh, biogas for to replace basically. Uh, LPG. So, so, so that's, that's very mundane. Cooking fuel is one of the most basic energy service. And, and most of the energy transition narratives that we are hearing is largely gargantuan or big types of energy transition. But we forgot, we almost always forgot that we still have, in particular in this region, we still have an issue of energy poverty. So not everyone has access to the electricity grid. Not everyone has access to this clean, efficient fuel. So the first key insight is really on the power of local community organizing. And this has been demonstrated by this particularly insightful and inspiring case study in the Thailand-Myanmar border. So that's the first one. The local communities can do things in terms of energy transition. The second important uh, insight that I would like to, to, to share is that despite, despite the fact that, that technologies are usually uh, considered innovative, um, most of or majority of uh, most successful types of energy transition technologies are actually cheaper to build, um, requires uh, readily or market ma readily available materials from the local market, and again, using some feedstocks that are also locally available. So on top of that, this, this community are also able to, to diversify the use of their energy transition uh, technologies. So not just about using this modified biogas digesters for cooking, but they also have the small scale 
um, solar PV systems for lighting. So they only not use it for lighting, but also for irrigation. So small scale farming have also benefited from the solar home systems. So, 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 that, so that's the second one. So technologies need not to be super duper innovative. The third one is really linking, linking um, local capacities with technology innovation. Uh, building capacities and strengthening the communities of uh, or strengthening the capacities of communities, uh, including including the deliberate strengthening and producing of local champions are really really crucial in terms of producing these stories of change. Um, these are not easily they are not easily produced uh, largely because of course uh, not everyone has the courage to to to, to really do the impossible. So in this particular setting, there is this particular person. Uh, who, who led the community in order for it to develop and produce these various uh, energy transition technologies. So those three things are really crucial uh, when looking at local community-oriented villages or even rural-oriented types of energy transitions. Uh, I hope that by now that, uh, that, that, and I know that most of us in, the, in this room really believe on the power of local. So small is beautiful. E.F. Schumacher have, have mentioned that in the 1970s in his book. Um, that small is beautiful. Uh, it doesn't. It, we 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 need, of course, we need uh, this big trans, big transformative changes in society, including the shift in which we generate electricity through renewable energy transition. But we should not forget about the, the last mile. Those who really need still access to to to, to basic energy services, including electricity and efficient cooking services. Oh, thank you. Um, one question, just a little follow-up, and we do have time for that. Um, was there one thing in particular about working with this community? I mean, how was it that they were able to switch to this like cheaper fuel that also you know, doesn't generate waste, right, and instead actually takes up their leftover waste and uses it? Like, was there a community leader, like you mentioned? Were they, you know, what was it that made this work? So it's actually a combination of, of, of a lot of things. So one, of course, is the need for a champion. That community leadership is really, really important to make sure that the community actually work together. But that's just one, right? So you also need members who are appreciative or who can recognize the, the need and also, and also the, the, the purpose, the purpose of, of, of introducing these technologies or even replacing what they have been using. So that's the second one. The third is really to make an economic, set, uh, economic, uh, economic case for this. Uh, so although these are rural households, money is still hard to come by. And making that case that this transformation or transition to seemingly mundane type of renewable energy transition technologies uh, is also economically fast feasible. So spending more, spending, uh, using more uh, household budget for other needs such as health, and education rather than just you know using it for, 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 for energy services for purchasing LPG tanks for example so those three and among others are also are, are also very crucial okay makes a lot of sense um, well thank you for sharing that and so lastly uh, we will go to mr. Hans Gutman, Gutman. Um, Another, you know, a very crucial part of policymaking is having the right data and tools to ensure that the projects also get carried out su successfully. So, uh, Hans, if you can share some of your experiences with us, uh, if there's anything you found inspirational from your experiences, I understand you were working and carrying out an international collaboration with NASA. Um, yeah, tell us about that. So, good morning, and uh, the pleasure being here, and thank you for inviting me for this, and I'm also um, very delighted that you managed to find a very old picture of me, so I, <laughs> I, I, I look a little bit more like in the past. Um, well, let me start uh, with just setting the scene, and then I will get into some of the examples. And um, I mean, the world is uh, basically littered by orphan successes, and what do I mean by that? Well, I'm sure many of us here have been involved in a small pilot thing that a donor or an institution supported, and we were successful, we achieved, um, but it didn't take off. It didn't scale up, it didn't become the norm. And that's what I mean by an orphan success. You were successful, but it actually didn't transform into anything and doing it. And why is that? Well, um, 
I think before we get into why is that, it's also important to say that I think the shift now has been for the past 50 plus years in that we should focus on evidence-based information and data to be able to drive new approaches, new solutions and issues. Whether that's in the social sphere or whether it's in the technical sphere, evidence-based information is important. And on top of that, going back to this orphan success, um, how do we avoid duplications or reinventing the wheel, etc.? And I think this gathering here is a good example of one of those tools is that we meet, we share, and we explain, and we try to um, make sure that um, other people get aware and perhaps interested in what uh, we are doing, as exemplified by the previous speaker here, who is in inviting you to look at in the website and, and engage uh, in these areas. Um, but it's also very important that tools, practices, and information is understood, is trusted, and that can then lead to ownership. Because you may find information out there, but particularly in the past seven, eight years, there's also a lot of misinformation. There's a lot of claims of certain things that they work, but they don't. And there's also deliberate um, misinformation sometimes. So how do you build up that trust to be able to actually engage? Well, I think it's important that that information um, is understood. If you just have a black box that you put information in and then the other end out comes other information, you may not really trust it. And you may want to use it if you trust the person who is promoting it because you have trust in that they understand it and they're doing it. So a trust issue is very important. And um, another aspect, I'm working primarily in disaster risk reduction, in, in early warnings, etc. And, and here, an important aspect comes on, on the responsibility and the accountability. As a mandated organization that gives out a warning, you have a responsibility that that is correct. And therefore, you can't just take information willy-nilly around the internet. You have to know where that information comes from and whether that's a trusted source. And how do you do that in an effective way? Um, on top of that, when we are talking about these orphan successes, it's also important to make sure that this success or this tool or approach is robust. Robust meaning it should work well under different circumstances, not just your particular circumstances, because it's then very difficult to scale. So bringing together all of these ones, and since um, we have limited time also, um, we need also to make sure that um, this information is applied for the benefit of people. So going back to the example, you were referring to our cooperation with ADPC, NASA, and the Mekong River Commission. Um, we have worked with them, and actually SCI and some other agencies have been involved in some of the work we're doing under this project also. Um, we added more remote sensing information to improve the early warning for the floods. And the flood warning is a regional flood warning from MRC given to the countries. But MRC does not have the mandate to issue an actual warning to the countries. It issues an advisory, which the countries use, compares with their own information, and then the mandated organization that has the responsibility has to issue that warning. Now, this flood warning system is very complex. And how does MRC in the Mekong region where trust is um, in sometimes short, uh, short, short supply? Um, well, actually, they spent a lot of time, and an MRC should be credited for this, they spent a lot of time for having people in the different countries to understand the actual models, to be able to vouch for it for their governments that this is pretty good. And it varies. Actually, the four countries involved are not giving the same timeline. Most of the countries give five days. There is actually technology in there for the moment to give more than 10 days. Other countries only give three days because of, again, how it fits into their uh, mandate, etc. So I think it's, it's important there that this works. It does add, and particularly for countries like Vietnam and Cambodia, benefits greatly from it, and they trust it in engagement. But it requires all of these steps in between. It requires that you do trust the data, that you know and understand, or at least feel comfortable with it before you can put it into your uh, government system. Now, coming back to why we are all here, um, 
I'd just like to leave you with a actual experience. Was one of the donors in, when I was with MRC was complaining. Uh, we're funding all of this and all you do is meet. You just meet, 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 and, and nothing happens. Well, things do happen, but we were explaining back to the donor, saying, um, you need trust to be able to cooperate. That's clear. International relations is, to a large extent, interests and trusts. And how can we trust each other if we don't know each other? Well, that's very difficult. And how can we know each other if we don't meet? And I think even with the COVID experience, meeting online for the first time is difficult to build the trust. So um, our argument was, yes, we meet a lot because we have a lot of things to build trust on. And only then can the cooperation move forward. In the interest of time, I stop here. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I think, you know, if all of our speakers have identified some crucial practices or maybe principles um, drawing from their experiences working in the fields right of building trust of finding local champions of listening to local communities um, and also just taking into account uh, vulnerable com communities and what they face and really trying to get people to see me and see each other where they are uh, we have some time for questions uh, and actually you can also ask questions for uh, people who were on the previous panel, since we didn't have that much time in the last panel. Uh, I will open the floor up. Uh, so if anyone wants to start with a question. Oh, there's a gentleman over there. Okay, well, uh, while we're waiting on the mic, maybe, you know, oh, can we give that one? Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, maybe my question is directed to Savini. Uh, I look at your profile in the MUA on top of this meeting, yeah? And you actually uh, put a letter, address a letter to the CEO of the Sun Commercial Bank in mid-August and with a uh, request for them to reply to uh, your letter by the end of August. Uh, this is about the Luang Prabang Hydro Power Dam, right? Which uh, I think SCB is involved. So did you get a reply? And what was the reply? Did everyone hear the question? Okay. Oh, should I repeat? Yeah, in other words, you wrote a letter to the CEO of the SCB okay. in mid-August and then uh, with a request in their letter for them to reply in basically two weeks, yeah? okay. uh, end of August. Thank so my you. question is, did you get a reply? And what okay. was the reply? So the short answer is not yet. <laughs> but uh, just uh, anyway, so let me say thank you. I really appreciate um, people reading the links <laughs> that I put in my profile. So essentially, just to give a little bit of context, so Fair Finance Thailand, uh, and this is actually one challenge, one big challenge also, right? So even though there's a lot of standards out there now, there's no guarantee that these standards will be enforced or followed or monitored, essentially. Um, so uh, at um, Fred Finance Thailand, because we noticed that SCB uh, sent the first, um, I think, uh, equator principle report, and so in which the bank has to disclose the projects for which they apply the equator principles, and they actually disclosed two projects, one of which is Long Pabang Dam. And that's actually the first time we can categorically say that the bank is actually lending to the project because so far no bank has come forward or advertised <laughs> that they lend to this project because I guess they know how controversial it was and because we tried to tell them how, you know, how high risk and all that. Um, but so we essentially noticed that um, all the project documents, uh, like for example, environmental impact assessments of the project were uploaded to the project developers website since 2021, essentially but SCB ascended, they adopted the equator principles in 2022, right? And then they basically said that this project kind of passed the equator principles. So our question simply is, well, how could it be possible, right? Since the project 
already kind of passed all the processes in 2021. So we kind of wrote the letter trying to explain some gaps. Um, and then, and actually we got an initial, and informally the bank said, uh, thank you for your concern, we're thinking through it and we're gonna respond. Uh, but so far we have received no response uh, officially. But I think to us, we also sent a letter to the Equator Principles HQ uh, about this and they said that, oh, we're sorry, we cannot speak for any of the signatories of Equator Principles uh, on any of the projects they finance. You'd have to talk directly to the banks. Um, so I think this is kind of, uh, I guess, a testament to the challenges that we're facing. Thank you. Question over there by the window. Okay, and then um, we can take both. And so just ask the questions first, and then we can have the answer. So we'll take two questions. Hello, everyone. I'm Dang from Vietnam. I have a question for Professor. Naru Emon, and thank you for very nice work that you work with the IP. Uh, you mentioned about the inspiring from the IP in the south of Thai, and but uh, I would like to learn more about like any challenges that you face in terms of like uh, languages, in terms of uh, culture and the way of life. Because I'm not sure you are IP, but uh, maybe. Can you share a little bit about this? Because I also work with IP, I mean, in technique uh, in Vietnam, and I would like to learn more from that. Another one, you mentioned uh, like the nature of, uh, I mean, the nature, the, the part of the IP life for the local people. And, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, in the context of climate change now, you know, like nature, forest, the biodiversity loss, like you know, happen around the world. I mean, especially the community. I mean, in 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 IP community, and uh, so in your experience, uh, how the IP face with this challenge, and I would like to learn more, like how go uh, Thai government had the like the unique or the the uh, special support for the IP. Yeah, because in Vietnam, you know, uh, the local people live nearby, I mean, along the coastal area, and uh, during climate change, you know, they try a lot of nature. And the local people now, you know, uh, couldn't, I mean, the nature part of their life, but now it's destroyed, and they do not have nothing, I mean, they do not have much the nature for their life. Uh, thank you. Uh, can we also take this question over there and then my answer? Thank you very much. It's very, very good uh, session, inspiring story of change. So I have a question for Hans. I really like your concept of trust, you know. I also have a question about trust as well. So, <laughs> so I think societies have become increasingly reflexive, particularly these days, on many things. That's why we have found a lot of social movement and local people say so, ask a lot of questions. Uh, for example, the presentation made by Kun Sarani uh, on hydropower, on climate change, on land issue, and on water issue, blah, 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 in the Mekong. So in your opinion, are there any erosion of trust in the institutions? You know, uh, because sometimes people do not trust the institution. They don't believe partly or mainly that the institution are able to protect them from climate change or other unsustainable development projects. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, uh, okay, yeah, if it's fresh, then Professor Naruma. Okay, thank you. And, uh question striking to the heart of the issues of trust, yes. Um, I, I mean, the old saying is that it takes years to build trust and it takes five seconds to lose it. Um, and I think that goes for institutions also. Um, and yes, I think the, in, in some areas there is a building of trust in the sense that you are providing the services, you are providing the information, you reach out and help, and that's important. Um, at the same time, uh, sometimes there is stonewalling and the stonewalling perceived stonewalling or real stonewalling in terms of releasing information whether that is for 
planning purposes, whether it's for actual impacts or whether there are uh, in the Mekong region issues about future water flows and impacts, etc. Um, but I think it's Im important also to, um, to, to realize um, the circumstances from the institutions. How um, accountable are they to the different responsibilities? And I, I take a hydrometrological, for example. They cannot willy-nilly make a prediction or take in the latest information without testing it and testing it and testing it so that their predictions are as good as practical. And um, at the same time, whenever they give the wrong predictions, there is an, an erosion in faith. And therefore, a number of them, like the Mekong River Commission, has refrained from giving a long warning. And the other one goes with projects and programs, etc. cetera. Um, there is difficulties sometimes to provide all of the information because it's private business involved. Um, there is a certain other areas, but there is also disclosure responsibilities. And if the enabling framework is not put in place, and uh, I don't know what the specifics are in Thailand and Laos, et cetera, for the moment. But if you turn to many countries, there is actually a requirement of disclosure of information. And there is a requirement for holding public hearings, et cetera. The issue of trust comes in whether you have that hearing and then you don't respond. You only have the hearing and, and nothing follows. Then you have an erosion of, of, of that as well. But if you have a hearing and then you explain why you do not take up the recommendations from some groups, or why you think that some things are over. Then you can build that trust. So I think it's a back and forth. And uh, in, in some cases, the non-disclosure of information is, is valid. Um, but in many cases, it's simply because it doesn't have any repercussions and potentially some negative effects. And it's something we have to build. And I think the pressure has to be kept up um, in, in order to have uh, institutions responsible. Sorry, it's a rather generic uh, answer, but we can go into specific uh, organizations if you long on, offline. Uh, now, Professor Naraman, I think we have two questions about your work with the indigenous communities. I think they also touch on issues of trust, right, of language first and communicating. Yeah. Thank you for the question about the indigenous community. I think I'll answer it shortly, and then maybe I carry out a con side conversation with you later. Um, I'm not indigenous uh, person myself, but then Asia Indigenous People Pact uh, work with all indigenous uh, organizations, um, especially the 46 members uh, that is present now. Um, when I work with uh, indigenous people as anthropologists, I have to learn the language. So I think that's part of the, uh, the issue on trust as well. So um, it's, uh, there's a lot of knowledge and uh, nuance um, in uh, learning the language. Uh, because if uh, adopting Kunsarini's taxonomy, uh, there's, uh, uh, you know, our taxonomy, there's ex taxonomy, the meanings, the boundaries are all different. So um, I think unless uh, we understand the language, we wouldn't understand like the deeper meaning. And for uh, the issue about uh, climate change and disasters and environmental change, these people are the front line because they live in the environment. But then their way of life, maybe I, because I study about the sea nomads, the nomadic ground, also absorb all these uh, shocks and changes in the environment. But then the, the state policy on sedentarization and centralized education also have the impact on these people as well. So now they cannot move anywhere. Sedentarization and land rights are seen as a necessity uh, for the people. Um, and also I think this is true with Vietnam also have the, uh, the hill tribe that practice shifting cultivation I think shifting cultivation is also seen as deforestation, whereas it's also uh, adaptation uh, in the forest environment. And if you have the, the long fallow period, then the, the soil will be able to re-nourish and regenerate. But then since the, the, uh, the fallow ha has been shortened, so now they have to use fertilizer, pesticides, and all those chemicals. So uh, we are reducing the capability of adaptation of these people. So there are a lot to be learned from them as well as there are a lot that uh, research and knowledge will have to be connected with policy. Thank you. Okay, uh, we have one question over there. 
Oh, and also a question back. So um, let's just take both questions first. Uh, my question is really a continuation of the response that uh, Professor Naruman just gave. Uh, working with indigenous co communities, uh, you did make a reference to oral histories, and oral histories are deep repositories of knowledge which can be uh, mainstreamed for contempt to address contemporary development challenges. But my question is, how does one even start to capture these oral histories, which are very contextual, which are very nuanced, in some way of um, bringing them together? The moment you start documenting them, they're no more oral. But that's the tension between oral histories and uh, documented knowledge. So I just was trying to understand how to go about these things. Uh, and then there was a question in the back. Um, hello. Uh, my question goes to uh, Dr. Lawrence uh, from Hong Kong University. You mentioned that you have been working with uh, the local communities in Thai Myanmar border. So my question is, uh, what uh, particular area of Thai Myanmar border is that? Uh, I, I'm from Myanmar, so yeah, I would like to know uh, yeah, about, about it. Uh, the, which particular area of Thai Myanmar border you have been working? Yeah, thank you. Um, do you want to just answer that? Because I think uh, that's a, a, one really exactly. easy. So it's a Padang community, which is our forest community in, in the Th Thailand Myanmar border. Padang, P A D E N G. Okay. Uh, and Professor Naraman on oral histories? Thank you. I think Padang community is also indigenous Korean community. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? Uh, um, about uh, oral history, yes, these people, since they don't have written uh, history, the oral history is dying down as well, especially older generations are passing away. And the younger generations, they are more addicted uh, to uh, new technology. So I, I think uh, what I believe is salvage ethnography and salvage uh, oral history. So if we re keep on recording before it's, uh, it's going away, and then afterwards, you know, there are resources that we can work on in the interpretation and in the understanding. But yes, in my case, it's really a challenge as well. Thank you. Uh, okay, I think we have time for one more question. So uh, the woman with the... Thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, my question direct to Ajana Rumon. So, um, I, as according to my understanding, Thailand's acts are trying to say that we have no indigenous people in Thailand and we, try, we have ethnical groups. So, with, with this differentiation, whether it's impact climate policies or financial support from externalities, thank you. Thank you. Actually, there's another question. Oh, um, we, we only have time for one, I'm sorry. Okay, actually this afternoon I cannot, in, I cannot join you because of the two events. One is uh, the draft law on uh, indigenous way of life is in the parliament. And another is that some of the Chao Lei, they came up from the south to sit in front of the parliament uh, to confirm and affirm the importance of this law. Uh, so I think... Uh, Actually, the, the term indigenous, indigenous is uh, quite worrisome, especially for those people who work on national security. But um, sometimes uh, we use the term uh, self-determination, according to UN DRIP. And I think uh, if Thailand would like to affirm that it's only cultural self-determination that these people have, um, that they would like to continue their way of life, and uh, uh, maybe relating to uh, the, the issue about energy. Actually, some indigenous people wouldn't like to have electricity. They said just a solar panel on their roof is enough. Electricity, electricity will bring more and more expense, like refrigerator, radio, whatever. So I, I think when we talk about uh, nobody being left behind, you know, left behind in what way, I think we have to consider that. And uh, yes. Uh, uh, we are looking forward to uh, our draft law, although it's ethnic groups, if we define it to include the people, uh, like we mentioned, I think that's all right. You know, we, we shouldn't just stick to, to the term. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Sorry, there's no more time for questions. Um, 
But I just want to end uh, with just one question for all of our panelists. Um, and maybe, and this gives the audience maybe some food for thought as we uh, go into the afternoon. So can you just talk about one major challenge that you are working on uh, that, you know, that's kind of your priority uh, in your field? Uh, we can start with Professor Delina and just go down the line. Yeah, so the, 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 big, uh, the big question that my research group is actually, uh, actually tackling among, among many questions is why despite this numerous case studies of, of successful cases, why we are not able to, do, to, to transform society. I think it was, Hans also have mentioned this earlier. So what are, what are the drivers for failure? Um, why is there a gap between policy making and these uh, stories from the ground? Why, 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 are we, why is policy lagging behind in terms of using these stories in crafting new policies? So that's basically my big question. Just to continue on that, I think the elephant in the room is uh, power in politics, um, right? And uh, I think that uh, the biggest challenge, I think, is that all the progress and momentum that we're making is not fast enough and you know, impactful enough to prevent more damage and suffering. Um, so my personal interest right now is on um, what I call state capture in Thailand, uh, state capture, especially of our energy and climate policies. Um, so anyway, so it's, it's very challenging. <laughs> And I think that it's challenging because there are slap lawsuits uh, that can kind of crop up out of nowhere. <laughs> so I think the conversation of, but I think it's a necessary conversation we need to have, at least in Thailand. And I think we need to be, find better ways to protect people who speak up about the problem. Thank you. I think in uh, my case, working with indigenous people, uh, the challenge is the, um, uh, also state and, and power. But then the, the mainstream thinking all about uh, development, about good life. Uh, I think we had some inspiring uh, word from Latin America, Ben Review, the good life that we, we think about. Uh, indigenous people's good life might not be the one, you know, that is uh, enriched with all these uh, materials. So I think it's difficult, you know, to try to, to understand and to have the voice uh, on these indigenous people. Thank you. Um, I think one of the key issues there is how do you unlock all of these resources that financing that is needed? And uh, I think it's been alluded to and it's been explicit in saying, how do we access all of that private finance that can help with this transition? And I think um, we have standard issues saying World Bank and EU and others, if you invest in disaster risk reduction, you get a return of one to seven um, in reduced cost in the future. But there's a huge gap from that generalization down to a private investor who's going to build a building or a bridge or something. What are the tools to be able to see that you have a cost-benefit analysis that includes risk reduction and see what those benefits are accruing as a income in the future because you are reducing the costs and the risks in the future? Those tools do unfortunately not exist, at least not as a generalized one, and how can we convince the private sector to do these investments when they don't have the basic tools for assessing whether they benefit from it financially or security-wise or uh, otherwise. So I think that's, that's a huge channel ahead, which I think we need to deal with straight on. Thank you. Thank you. Power, money, politics, what it all boils down to. Okay, thank you so much. <laughs> Our panelists, um, this was really great. Um, I learned a lot from all four of you. Um, and now we will have a highlight. Oh, sorry, applause. <laughs> Thank you so much, guys. And now we will have, oh. Oh, sorry, oh, I am so sorry. Um, we will have the image, illustration summary from uh, Tofu Creative. Uh, they've been hard at work while we were talking. And if um, Ms. Desiree D, if she wants to come and speak about her illustrations, um, that'd be cool. Oh, oh, sorry, photo first.
Hi. Hi, everyone. So here's just a quick snapshot of the panel discussion on inspiring stories of change. So we'll be continuing to capture the afternoon sessions as well. And we can share with you the Miro link where you could access um, all of these visuals. And you could also just come up to us in the booth. Yes. OK, so that's the Miro link. OK, thanks, everyone. I'll pass it on back Thank to you. you. Uh, all right, before we break for lunch, uh, we just have one more uh, speaker, and uh, that's Dr. Chayanis Krita Sutachiwa. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing her name. Um, she is the MTT program director and also the SEI Asia Center deputy director. Please welcome her to the stage. She's already there. Thank you very much, um, everyone. And good afternoon. Actually, we over lunchtime already. So that's why I feel so much pressure, honors, and also have a great pleasure to finish this really quickly, you know. Um, why I feel so much honors? Because I'm representing the voices of almost 150 agents of change. And if you see your face, in the photos here, can you please stand up, please? All agents of change that joined so much this discussion yesterday, you're part of the stories. You're part of these contributions. Can everyone please give big hands to everyone who stands? <laughs> what I'd like to share here is really rich discussions. We are here as individual and organizations continue learning. The reason why we have yesterday's discussions because we really believe that the Mekong region facing so much challenge linking with water, energies, and climate. And without anyone doing anything business as usual, we will not have a good life for ourselves. And we will not have a good life for our kids, you know. People always ask me, Cheyanit, you always talk about you as a mom and you have a kid of 14 years old son. Because that is the biggest matter for me, why I'm here. And I think you, in your heart, you have the biggest thing and most priorities for your life as well. And we believe that by individual actions, by the organization's practice, we can make this world changing in the way that we believe is the better place to live. We are emphasizing the role of policy influencing organizations, PIO, as agents of change. We learn from more than 100 organizations who really have a lot of actions trying to make the change. We already heard a lot of good solution here, this option. But what are the key question is, how can we make people believe in this? How can we make people change their behavior after doing the same thing for 20 or 30 years? We need someone. We need our own belief to make this change. We asked more than 100 organizations, what are you feeling as the most important strategies that you think can influence the change? And we found that five, the three strategies. One is the communications to be more inclusive. Second, to make sure that you build good relationship. And the third one, make sure that your actions is very inclusive based on the evidence. And this is really rich kind of drawing. Kun Desilis have portrayed very well, very nice, what we have really discussed. I will not pick up each of this because I think you can associate your experience yourself. But why it's important for us to be gathering here is because I really feel that we need to remind ourselves why we are here and why we are working, continue persisting this for 20 years, 30 years, 
Even someone told me, Dr. Huan say, I'm doing this 50 years. We still need to continue learning how we can do this better, how we can make sure that our communication have the real stories on the backside of us, show people with the evidence on our communications, the fact on ground, how this type of the action can change the life of people, can save the children life, can make people suffering from the flood or drought better. That is the communication. Most powerful communication is the communication with the language that people can understand. Communications with checking them whether they perceive or get the similar messages. Communications with your heart that you bear responsibility of the message to deliver. Thinking about those who will be affected from what you try to influence every day. You have senior people, you have the young people, we have people with disabilities. Please keep this in mind. The second is building relationship. It's one of the most powerful influence strategies. This is need long-term commitment, need patience, need sincerities, need support, need not to be aware, need to care. And I would like to personally express our sincere gratitude to the government of Sweden who provides long-term support to Sustainable Mekong Research Network and now Australian government supporting Mekong Thought Leadership Think Tank Network. I received enormous support and really encouraging message from our members in the Summit and MTT family that what we are now doing, it's really very, very important to the region. Why? Because we are now creating home. We're creating big tree from 20 years of investment, from general support from donors, from the heart and effort from more than 800 individual network members for more than 200 organizations, building this big home, building this big tree. And we hope that this big home and big tree will house so many people with passions. All of us are agents of change, and we are here together. What we are still lacking, and I would like to make special requests as one of agents of change and one as a mother, in the afternoon sessions, we have so many working groups sessions. We discuss a lot of options, your practice, your examples. I just have two requests. The first request is, could you really show us the practical solutions that can lead, that can make the agents of change of us easy to communicate with real example with the life at the backside, that is the one. And the second is, can you, when you talk about this, can you really tell us where is the space for people? Where is the space for gender equities, people with different ability, and social inclusion in your solution there? We would like to have that both to carry with us with our two hands, to carry with not only brain, but with our true belief when we communicate, when we want to influence the change. We want to have that belief at the backside, to talk with all people who have everyday decisions to make and to change our own behavior, to be real examples, and to make this world a better place with everyone to have a good life. Thank you very much. Thank you. So before we break for lunch, uh, just reminding everyone where these parallel sessions are happening this afternoon. Uh, so they will start at 1.30 p.m. 
The first one, how can we make nature-based solutions work for climate resilience and biodiversity is in ballroom three. Uh, second one, just green energy solutions for urban resilience is in Pompadour. Transboundary climate risk. Oh, this is all up there. Great. <laughs> Please make a note of this. And we will come back to the reporting session at 15 o'clock in ballroom 2-3. Thank you. Enjoy lunch. <laughs>